Hello everyone, welcome to what is to be our last Bible study before the summer break. You're very welcome to join us this evening. Uh, if you have a Bible, feel free uh, to open it at the letter to Titus uh, in the New Testament. And tonight we're looking at chapters 2 and 3. It is uh, a small letter as regards uh, some of the other uh, rather larger letters in the New Testament as it only has three chapters. And tonight we're finishing it off as we look together at chapters 2 and 3 of the book. The Methodist theologian Adam Clark said this about chapter 2 of Titus. Few portions of the New Testament excel this chapter. It may well form the creed, system of ethics and textbook of every Christian preacher. Does any man inquire what is the duty of a gospel minister? Send him to the second chapter of the epistle to Titus for a complete answer. That's an interesting take on this uh, chapter uh, 2 uh, in the letter to Titus. And there's so much in there. And we're going to look at that together uh, tonight along with chapter 3. So let's look at the first verse of chapter 2 as it opens. It says, But as for you, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. This is linking on, of course, to the end of chapter 1. Remember, never take scripture out of context by simply reading one line or even a couple of verses without looking at the, the broader scope of writing around the verses you're looking at. So we must get an idea of the flow of the pen, if you will, of Paul to Titus and not uh, just to simply pick and choose uh, different wordings and, and lines for ourselves. So it links on from the end of chapter 1. You remember there was that ongoing debate that Paul found in many churches uh, in the early Christian era, that sense of uh, the Jewish converts uh, fighting for the keeping of circumcision, which was so important to them, over the Gentile converts who never had that, and obviously didn't feel the need for that and the Jewish converts thought they were somehow a little more high and mighty over the Gentile converts. So that is coming towards the end of chapter 1 we looked at the last time and how Paul chastises them uh, for what they believe. This is the Jewish converts against the, the Gentile converts. As for you, he says in chapter 1, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. Now doctrine, uh, you could do a whole seminar, maybe 10 seminars on what doctrine is, but really uh, I suppose watered down in everyday speech, it's like a, a system of belief, uh, a chain uh, of beliefs uh, we put together, which is doctrine. Sound doctrine. Now in here, it's not just something that's kept in your head, and that's what Paul is trying to teach Titus and the, and the early church at Crete. Uh, that uh, sound doctrine is not simply something we know, but something we practice. Doctrine must be practiced to have any uh, weight, really, uh, in Christianity. So Titus is to teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. It's a great word. Sometimes we use soundness today. We might say, oh, that preacher is sound, or that teacher is sound. And we might think, well, that only links to our own theology. If it agrees with our theology, we might say that person is sound. But it's to do with Scripture. At the end of the day, what is there in context in Scripture, what God is trying to say through Scripture, that is the base of soundness in any doctrine or teaching of God's Word. That everything goes back to the origin of Scripture. So it's not just in our head, but in practice. And then different groups of people are brought out uh, in this chapter. First of all, we have older men, then older women, then younger women, then younger men, and finally slaves or servants. Very interesting what's going on here. Very pertinent to the, the Cretan church at the time. And Titus is to deliver. He's the man, remember, he's the man with the gifts and skills that Paul has appointed to do this. And so in chapter or chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Tell the older men to be temperate, serious, prudent, 
and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Here we have the older men being told by a younger man. Now you may have come across that sometimes folks who are of more mature years in life or, or older in the faith even mightn't take that well to a younger whippersnapper uh, telling them what they should be doing or even teaching them. Titus is a young man and here he is being told by Paul to tell the older men to be temperate, serious, prudent and sound in faith, in love and endurance. And some people might say, well, he's teaching grannies to suck eggs here. Not necessarily the case. Just because the older men have life experience doesn't mean that their faith journeys are any wiser than the younger man. And we must look at that. Yes, life experience may be there as it comes with age, but in the sense of faith journeying and following the Lord, the older man may not be as mature as this younger man, Titus, is going to uh, teach them. So these things, temperateness and uh, seriousness and prudence, Soundness in faith, love and endurance does not necessarily come with age. And that's why Titus is asked to uh, speak these words uh, to the older man. Look at the word sound again, sound in faith. There you have that, not just in the head again, but in practice, to be sound in our faith. The older men are told not to be passive, but active in their faith by these words that Titus is to tell them about. So being temperate, in other words, being very level in your disposition, uh, also in how you express yourself, all of that. Serious, to be serious about the faith. Prudent, yes, that's uh, something about uh, getting rid of dead wood in our lives that shouldn't be part of our faith, things that we need to keep away from, entrapment of sin and things like that. Sound in faith, standing on the word of God in love and endurance. So sticking with the word of God no matter what, but to do it in love and to share that message uh, with others. So the older men are not to be passive. Sometimes we as Christians we feel we might get to a certain age and think, ah, oh, that's only for the younger people to get on with or whatever. All I can do is this or all I can do is that. Never ever say that. Whatever we do for the Lord, no matter what age we are, and if we feel that maybe the sense of the physical activity is waning, there's many things we can still do in our maturity for the Lord. So we never give up. We are never passive in our faith, always active. And I remember talking to a very aged lady one time and uh, all she said was, all I can do now is pray. And you said to yourself, all I can do is pray. It's an amazing backbone to other Christians, amazing backbone to the church, an amazing gift to have. It's not all I can do. It's being active and not passive. So that should not depreciate uh, with age. And so we have the older men here being told by Titus to do these things. Then we go on to the older women in verse 3. Likewise, tell the older women to be reverent in behaviour, not to be slanderers or slaves to drink. They are to teach what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, interesting take here. And I want you to imagine for a minute Titus telling older women. It doesn't seem culturally viable uh, here. You can imagine this young man sitting down with older mature ladies and telling them these things. Uh, but that's part and parcel uh, of what Paul has instructed him to do. And uh, you can see him in that, <laughs> in that particular uh, theatre uh, where he has these older women listening to his teaching. Now, it's quite strong stuff in here. We have the word slanderers. The older women are to be reverent in their behaviour, not to be slanderers. Now, this is simply not the sense of uh, talking about people and lying about them by, uh, by gossip and by other terrible things that people might share amongst each other. And whether it's true or not, gossip is always wrong. 
slandering is, is, is taking it into the form of lying about someone else. And in fact, if you go back to the original Greek, uh, in this chapter, the word slanderer equates to devil. That's how strong Paul is coming across here. So someone who is at that sort of activity is devilish, according to uh, the original Greek within there. Queens of gossip. So Paul is saying to these older women, you're not to be like that, to come away from that. Not to be a slave to drink, someone who, who is inebriated or someone who is hooked uh, on alcohol. Uh, so the older women are not to be like that either. Uh, they're to be reverent in their behaviour. Uh, so that What that actually means in the Greek context is that they are to be suitable for office. So the older women here to be reverent, suitable to take a position in the church. So they're not to be these queens of gossip. They're not to be hooked on alcohol. Uh, they are to teach what is good. So it's quite a challenge there to the older women uh, in the Cretan church, the early Cretan church. And then these older ladies have a job to do. We see in verses 4 and 5, so that they may encourage the young women. Now, this is definitely not done. Titus is a young man sitting with young women. This is where it changes, where he actually enables one of the groups here in chapter 2 to do something else with another group. So the older women... They're passing on news and teaching to the younger women, not Titus himself directly this time. So they are to love their husbands, to love their children. That makes sense for a strong family unit. They are to be self-controlled, chaste, good managers of the household, kind, being submissive to their husbands, so that the word of God may not be discredited. A lot of stuff in here for the younger women. Now, where the cutoff is with ages here, we don't know. Uh, Cretan society, I'm not just quite sure when a lady became, inverted commas, an older woman, or what constitutes a younger woman. Probably not much difference than we are today regarding age, uh, age sections in our lives. But the younger women here are being taught by the older women. They're to teach these younger women uh, the importance of these things. If we don't live in a godly manner, God is discredited. See, the word of God in there in verse 5 may not be discredited or uh, made a mockery of. The word of God, that's the whole teaching of God's Bible, God's word may not be discredited. You see, you and I don't have to speak bad words against God's word. You can actually live it and still discredit his word by some of the things in here the young ladies may or may not be doing. If they're not self-controlled, chaste, in other words, staying with one husband, one man, good managers of the household, looking after their family. But that also could include the financial status. That doesn't mean the men do all that. The women can have a hand in that as well. Good managers of the household. They're kind, being submissive to their husbands. And remember, folks, this is not a bow down and grovel to your husband, ladies. Uh, this is this sense of mutual respect that Ephesians 5 draws out. You see, you can't. this is just taken out of context thing. You may say to yourself, okay, missus, you're going to bow down to me. I'm your husband. That takes completely out of context what Ephesians 5 teaches us. You can't say one thing in the Bible and change it into something else. Ephesians 5 talks about that submission as a mutual respect, man and his wife and a wife and her husband. So that's what's going on in there. So the word of God may not be uh, discredited or blasphemed. It's quite sobering. Like how you and I live, particularly for the younger ladies here, but it speaks to the broader church too. And you and I are not discrediting the word by our actions. Never mind our words. And then verses uh, 6 to 8. We look in chapter 2. This is about the younger men this time. Likewise. I notice that word. It's a hinge word. From verse 5 to verse 6. Likewise. The younger men aren't getting off here. They have stuff to do as well. 
just like the younger ladies. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. The Cretans, by nature, were a very uh, rebellious bunch of people, it seems, certainly at this time in their history. So the younger men, as well as the younger women, one of the big things is to give them self-control, that they have that in their lives. And to show yourself in all respects a model of good works. There again, you have the works thing coming out. But remember, it works always follows faith in the Christian world. Not the other way around. But the young men are to be models of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, gravity and sound speech. There's that word again, soundness. Based on the word of God. Sound speech that cannot be censured. That any opponent will be put to shame, having nothing evil to say of us. So the young men also get a charge here uh, within this, similar to the ladies, likewise. And uh, those things they are to be doing, to be self-controlled is the big one. <clears throat> to be good workers and uh, people of integrity and sound speech. So that there's those outside the church look in and go, yeah, there's something attractive here. Something magnetizing about these people that draws others closer to the Lord as well. So nobody can say anything evil uh, of them. And that's quite challenging too. Uh, that out there for Christians, the, the wider world is watching. It's observing how Christians act. And uh, sometimes a wrong word or a wrong act can turn somebody away forever from coming to the Christian faith. That's quite challenging. It is. I remember when we let the Lord down through those means, there's still, of course, a way back through his grace to be forgiven of that. I hope we never find ourselves in that position. And perhaps we may not, never know that this side of eternity anyway. But we need to be careful with our words and our actions as we serve the Lord so that nobody can say anything evil uh, of us. Then verses 9 and 10, the last group here in chapter 2 is the slaves or servants. And it says these words, Tell slaves to be submissive to their masters and to give satisfaction in every respect. They are not to talk back, not to pilfer, but to show complete and perfect fidelity, so that in everything they may be an ornament to the doctrine of God our Saviour. Now it's interesting here, servants or slaves in early Cretan society, or certainly in this period of Cretan society, in the church they would have possibly a different position. In society, they worked under a master. Of course, the master looked after them, or supposed to do, and take care of them, and always give them a roof over their head, pay them a little bit of money, perhaps, too. They're not to be uh, beaten to within an inch of their lives and used as an absolute uh, uh, slave as if they're in prison. They are to respect them. But this is about the slaves or servants being submissive to the masters. But outside of that... Um, domiciliary work, if you will, where the slave is working under the master, out in society it could be different. There were slaves or servants of a master who would be in a higher position in the Christian church than their master. Now it's interesting, in Cretan society that was the case, not always, but it did happen, where a servant who worked under a master in the home setting, the other way around in church, where the servant could have had a higher position, than the master. So that's what was going on too. But here, this is speaking of the uh, the home setting. So they are to be submissive to their masters, to give satisfaction in every respect, to do the best they can, not to talk back, to take orders, and not to give off back, not to pilfer, so not to steal. Now why Titus is mentioning this, or Paul rather writing to Titus, is it was common a servant stole of their masters. And uh, the masters never knew half the time. They stole off them. But they're to show complete and perfect fidelity, perfect faithfulness again to their master, so that in everything they may be an ornament. And you think of an ornament, it's kind of a showpiece. So the slave or the master is really a showpiece for the Lord by the way they live and act. Again, reflection of Christ within the servant under the master and the master is not a Christian the servant's witness is very powerful in that so that they can be an ornament to the doctrine of God our saviour 
So it's, it's lovely to see that, that the work of the servant can be very, very important uh, in this period of Cretan society. They're not just simply a slave that people kick about or don't look at or they're subhuman in some way. They do have uh, a great job to do for Christ as well here in this passage. Moving now to verses 11 to 14, this is where the chapter changes a little now and it speaks of this beautiful word we know as grace and uh, Titus draws that out here in 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright and godly. While we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Now, this wonderful word grace. Grace, as Paul is speaking to Titus, is at the centre of everything in the Christian faith. First of all, in verse 11, grace brings salvation, not good works, not living a good life, not giving money to charity or even to church, not even serving in the church. All those good things, but without the grace of Christ, first of all, they are not worth anything. Grace must come into our lives first through the cross because we all need the forgiveness of sins. And only through Christ's grace, that wonderful, unmerited favour to you and I of God's love, that we pick up that, that we respond to the cross. Yes, it's there for the, for the giving. You and I have to receive it. We can still repel it. We have to receive it for ourselves. And we do that by grace, which simply means God loves us as we are and to take us, to bring us to salvation uh, through the forgiveness of sins. So this word grace is very important to Paul as we know right through all his letters and here again he's highlighting it here uh, in Titus. Grace is the centre of faith but also of works. When you and I come to faith and know salvation in Christ we are to work for him all our days. We are uh, uh, creatures of service when we come to know the Lord and we're to do that by grace as well. You and I cannot serve the Lord effectively without his grace and his strength, and his Holy Spirit. And so grace is a centre of faith and works. Another quote for you, this time from Spurgeon, uh, one of the great preachers of the 19th century, uh, and, uh, and writers as well. Uh, and he says this uh, about verse 12, which says to us, first of all, in the, the text, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright and godly. And Spurgeon says this, The disciple of grace, according to the apostle, has three results. Denying, living and looking. You see the three words before you. And he's speaking specifically of verse 12 in chapter 2. I'll say this again. The disciple of grace, according to the apostle, has three results, denying, living, looking, and you see the three words before you. And there they are in verse 12. We see them as self-control, uprightness, and godliness. And they equate exactly to Spurgeon's interpretation of that. He sees it as denying. To be self-controlled is to deny things that take us away from our control of who we are. He sees living, uprightness, Following the Lord is true living and to be upright in him. And godliness, of course, is the other word there in verse 12. And Spurgeon sees it as looking, looking, looking to the Lord in all that we do. Looking to him for his strength and power in all that we do. That's what gives us self-control and uprightness to start with. We look at verse 13 and it says these words, While we wait for the blessed hope and manifestation of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, 
There, the passage is talking about the second coming. Paul's never far away uh, from bringing out the second coming, and he speaks it here to Titus as well. We're waiting for the blessed hope and manifestation of the glory. So that's the second coming, Jesus coming back, and of course he's coming in all his glory next time, and not as a baby, to uh, bring all his uh, followers home to heaven. And uh, in here we see the words great God. It's the only place in the New Testament that the word megas is used. In this context, megas is really, oh, it's just hard to really describe God, but his greatness is there. And this is the best that Paul can give of human words to describe God. But the word is megas, meaning he's simply mind-blowingly great. And that's the only place in the New Testament you see this. And this sense of the return of Christ. I want to share with you something which uh, I think is quite poetic. I don't know who wrote this. But it does speak a lot about uh, Jesus' second coming uh, in a poetic fashion. And based of course on the life of Christ. And what scripture teaches us about him and his coming back. And I'll read it out. Speaking of Jesus, the he in these words is Jesus. He came first time to save the soul of man. He will come a second time to resurrect the body. He came first time to save the individual. He will come a second time to save society. He came first time to a crucifixion. He will come a second time to a coronation. He came first time to a tree. He will come the second time to a throne. He came first time in humility, he will come the second time in glory. He came first time and was judged by men, he will come the second time to judge all men. And finally, he came first time and stood before Pilate, he will come the second time and Pilate will stand before him. It's an interesting little uh, poetic prose, really. Uh, someone's seen it as a lot of Jesus' life in there and what the future will be uh, of Jesus' uh, second coming. And finally, verse 15. Declare these things, says Paul to Titus, exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one look down on you. So we see in preach and teach with authority. When you stand in the word of God and the Holy Spirit enables preaching and teaching, it's very powerful. It's God speaking directly. Declare these things. Get them out there. Exhort. That's a sense of warning. Warn the church. Reprove with all authority. And let no one look down on you. This is a wee bit like, you remember Paul speaking to Timothy, a young man. Let not your youth be trampled on, basically. Don't let others look down on you because you're young. Titus is the same. Look, let no one look down on you. And that goes for all who are young in the faith. And this is nothing to do with age. All who are young in the faith, who have come to Jesus recently, let no one look down on you. You have a part to play in, in serving uh, the Lord as well. Into chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. So the teaching and how people should see each other in the church uh, continues here in these verses. Those difficult Cretans that Paul is writing to uh, through Titus. They were, they were a difficult bunch, it's seemingly here uh, as it's drawn out, particularly back in chapter 1, you remember verse 12, their Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gluttons, not a good CV for them at all. Uh, so they, they were a hard group of people, I think, to, to work with in many ways. And it's only by grace and through the Holy Spirit can these things happen. To be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle and to be showing courtesy to everyone. Now it's very difficult. We're humans. We feel the Lord. We feel each other. Uh, but this is what can happen by grace uh, in church and fellowship for the Lord. 
And a reminder in verse 3 that we're not to judge, not to judge each other. And this is for the Cretans too, that the Christians uh, upon the island, regardless of any other background, Gentile or Jewish, are not to judge the Cretans. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. Yes, that's things of the past before we come to Christ. Those things should be put to bed or are certainly being buried uh, throughout our lives because the Cretans live like this. But at the same time, Paul is saying, don't judge them. You were once like that too, like all these things. And we're not uh, to do these things now or to judge the Cretans themselves. A reminder to the church. Then verses 4 uh, to 8 says these words. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This Spirit is poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things so that those who come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. So again, grace is in here and the fullness of regeneration in Christ is being drawn out. Again, grace before works. Remembering this little quote, I don't know who said this, that faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. i say that again. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. In other words, faith uh, by grace that you and I come to Christ, that's the only way we can be saved. But if you and I have a life of works ahead of us, Faith that does not show works is dead. We knew that from the letter of James in the Bible. So you and I are called to a life of service for the Lord. So faith that saves is not alone. It is coupled with works, but it must follow uh, grace. It must follow our coming uh, to faith. And that's all drawn out uh, in this scripture here. Particularly, uh, as you look at verse 5, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the water of rebirth. That's the symbolism. Remember baptism on the outside, that you and I have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit within, and we're now li living transformed lives for the Lord, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a twofold thing. The water is simply symbolism of what is going on inside our lives, that we're being renewed, being restored and regenerated for the Lord. But we cannot live the life for the Lord from that moment on without the Holy Spirit. So as the baptism of the Holy Spirit is us being filled by him and to serve him and follow him. And this Spirit is poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. And justified by his grace. Verses 9 to 11 then of chapter 3. And these are other uh, teachings uh, from Paul through Titus to the church. Avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. After a first and second admonition have nothing more to do with anyone who causes divisions. Since you know that such a person is perverted and sinful, being self-condemned. Now there are strong words in there, and again we have a lot of teaching in here. This is coming out of the Jewish problem again against the Gentiles, the converts to the church, the Jewish converts and the Gentile converts. And this is some of the things the Jewish converts still held on to. Stupid controversies, in other words, getting fights with the Gentiles that shouldn't be there at all. Genealogies, the Jewish are very big into family trees. The Gentiles weren't. Dissensions, that's a sense of splits. Quarrels about the law, the Jewish converts still adhere to the law. 
They were still trying to get used to what grace is, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Now, people continue to live like that. Now, we might say to ourselves, that's back in Titus's day, but this sort of thing goes on in the modern church. People who stick to the letter of the law, in inverted commas, rules and regulations, rather than grace. And what that means. And Paul is clear about that throughout many of his letters. We are saved by grace, not by the law, not by obeying rules and regulations that we think are the way to Christ. The Bible is clear about that. Then here it's the same. Quarrels over the law. Looking at somebody who hasn't obeyed a rule or a regulation in church and all of a sudden they're cast out or an outcast in some way. Where's grace in that? Yes, of course, if someone is living in a very open and uh, a sinful life out there, don't seem to be seeking any forgiveness for, that's a different story. But here we have very little grace in this situation. They're unprofitable and worthless. And people continue to live in this type of life. It says here in verse 10, after a first and second admonition. So this person or persons are to be approached and if they continue to live like that, they get a second go. So you have a first time of, of advising them or exhorting them. And then second time they still do it. Have nothing more to do with them. They're causing divisions. Since you know that such a person is perverted and sinful, being self-condemned, they might even realise that what they're doing is not of the Lord. And they're walking down a path of self-condemnation without even realizing it so the problem still persists here in the Cretan church and you can see how this still goes on even today uh, in the modern church verses 12 to 15 as we finish up uh, tonight on Titus uh, chapter 3 you see a lot of names in here when I send uh, Artemis to you or Tychicus do your best to come up to me at Nicopolis for I have decided to spend the winter there. Make every effort to send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way, and see that they lack nothing. And let people learn to devote themselves to good works in order to meet urgent needs, so that they may not be unproductive. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with all of you. Now, you find this happens quite a lot, uh, either at the beginning, but more often toward the end of Paul's letters. He comes out with all these names that, for you and I, they might mean anything, because we might not come across them anywhere else in the Bible. We're told very little about them. Uh, in here we see Zenos there in, in verse uh, 13 as a lawyer. A little bit more about him. But as for Artemis and Tychicus uh, and Apollos, if this is the same Apollos that is earlier in the New Testament, we know a little bit about him, but it could be a different man. Uh, the others we don't know very much about. But it is important that names are in there because, first of all, what Paul is doing by announcing these people, they are obviously uh, helpers for him. They are undergirders support for him. He has a great network of support in all the churches that he goes to, has been to, has written to. And these people are important in that. He's obviously encouraging them uh, in themselves and what they're doing is, is a good job. But he's also highlighting the network of support that he has. And also on top of that, he's showing the world the church is growing. I can mention names of people who are involved in the work of Christ. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Why he brings out names, indicating growth and support mainly. They are important to the letters. Nicopolis is a place there in verse 12. It doesn't exist today. There is a ruin of it still available. And uh, it's on mainland Greece. If you're ever out there, worth a checking it out. Nicopolis means the city of victory. And it was built by one Octavian. And I ask you, do you know Octavian? Who was Octavian? He's known by another name, a uh, much better and more common name than Octavian. He was, in fact, the very first Roman Caesar, Augustus. And he is the one that got Nicopolis uh, off the ground uh, at that time. 
on mainland Greece. So here we have, towards the end of the chapter, Paul is drawing out the importance of ministerial support and he addresses the needs of others. You see that there in verse 13? Send Zenos and Apollos and see that they lack nothing. That's a challenge to us folks. When we're sending people out of the church to serve the Lord, it could be a missionary, it could be somebody going off to ordination, somebody going to another ministry in the church, whatever it might be, make sure they lack nothing. It's a bit of a failure if we as a church or individuals send somebody out, God bless you, and send them away, even pray for them, that's all good stuff. But practically, are we looking after their needs as well? So it's a challenge in all of that. Because verse 14 draws that out. Let people learn to devote themselves in good works. This is the backup to the uh, coming to faith by grace. So that these folks uh, who shouldn't lack anything, we in our good works are helping them to get on with the work of Christ. To meet urgent needs, says there, so that they may not be unproductive. So it's a challenge to us that the needs of others, particularly in the Lord's service, uh, are seen to. And Paul finishes up the chapter and the book in the way he does with many of them. Grace be with you. Grace to all this time, not just to Titus, as he started the letter with. He finishes with grace to everyone and uh, greet everyone who loves us in the faith as he sends those warm greetings uh, to the church. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed not just this uh, study, but I hope you've been able to see many others uh, over uh, these last months. We are having a break now for the summer, but do join us again in September, uh, where Bible studies will be live uh, in the, the church hall at Middletown, but then again also recorded as is happening now uh, after those particular studies they are recorded uh, uh, sort of what actually happened live uh, on the evening itself. May God bless you and keep you safe and we'll pray together before uh, we depart. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being with us, not just this evening, but uh, all year in our studies. We thank you for your word and may, Lord, your teaching continue to penetrate our hearts and minds and our lives as we serve and follow you. We pray, Lord, that uh, some of the amazing teaching, even in Titus tonight, will continue to challenge us as we live lives of grace, lives that are saved through the blood of Christ on the cross, and then sent to serve you, Lord, wherever we may be, or wherever you call us to, help us to be people of works in service for you, to build your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.